Okay. Now, that big change we talked about with growing our own food versus hunting and gathering is something that's referred to as the Neolithic Revolution. Okay. This is a shift from gathering to producing food or agriculture as we know it today. Okay. And what we need to know and they talk about is this happens in river valleys throughout various parts of the world. Uh, the most famous being referred to in civilization books as the Fertile Crescent uh, in the Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. But also if you look at the Nile, the Egyptians along that river valley, uh, in the Indus River Valley um, between India and Pakistan today, or uh, the Ganges River, or in China, uh, the Shang Dynasty as well as along the Yangtze and other rivers over there. This idea takes place at various places at almost similar times, but almost always involves river valleys, a source of water and river valleys that flood to re-fertilize the soil. Okay? Now our hunters and gatherers had to tightly control our population because they didn't control their food supply. Okay? So they would do some things that we might read about that seemed really cruel. Okay? If we think someone might end up being uh, sick or we've got too many uh, female babies being born, they might leave some of them to die. That seems cruel, but realize if we have too many women of childbearing age, our population can grow too rapidly. Okay? Luckily, these things have changed. Technological advances, okay? Agriculture frees people up to do other tasks, like make tools that maybe help us grow even more food or defeat the enemy so that, you know, they're trying to steal the excess food that we've got. Lots of things that we've done uh, all made possible with the fact that we decided to grow our own food and stay in one place. Okay? And this also allows for some things as well, which is one of this is a division of labor, okay? And we take that uh, idea of having um, agriculture and a division of labor, this leads to civilization. Because not only folks inventing new technology, they're inventing things like writing systems to uh, re make records and keep information for long periods of time. Uh, over here we've got Henry Ford's uh, idea of an assembly line. Now artisans, these are folks who are workers who are skilled in a craft, okay? Not necessarily an artist, but someone who does you know, very high quality work uh, making whether it be shoes or homes or whatever it is, clothing, okay, that person is could then considered an artisan. Okay. And then these things lead to the idea of trade, which as we mentioned, if you're trading, you're going to see ideas spread, cultural diffusion. And today what we've got a problem is, is many developing nations are exporting this idea of cash crops through trade and importing manufactured goods. They don't have skilled workers and artisans so much uh, in factories producing high quality things at a low price. They've got to grow crops and export them and sell, take that money to buy manufactured things. Okay. Now, so the Industrial Revolution this is a big change. New uh, factories, it should say, uh, these are oftentimes, let me correct that for you real quickly, new factor Reese, uh, uh, maybe just one S, okay. Uh, these are usually in cities because we need a work supply. Uh, folks who are in agricultural rural areas actually will move there to get a job because some of the things they're making in the factories, new tools for farming, actually mean we need fewer laborers, okay. Now they're out of job. Luckily, we need them in the factories. Moving to the cities and increasing the size of the cities is something called urbanization, okay. Now we're looking at something called the age of imperialism. And the age of imperialism is when Europeans controlled other parts of the world economically and politically. Okay? That is to say, they went in and took over and forced them to produce those cash crops so that, or mined some material that they took back to their home country, turned into a tool, a manufactured good, which then they sold back to you. And they also controlled you politically. They made treaties with other places. They set the rules. You had to do what they had to say. And the Europeans, this is uh, Cecil Rhodes here, and referring to the British Empire, weren't the only ones. Hey, we were doing it too. Okay. So let's look at the idea of nationalism. If you're being taken over by some other country, after a while you get this idea that we want to become our own country and have independence, kind of like we did from England. It became America instead of the British American colonies. Okay? Nationalism is a pride in and loyalty to one's country. And this idea spreads, especially after World War II. Colonies of former European countries embrace this idea, and we're going to see a birth of new nations. A lot of them in Africa, other places around the world, that process is still going on. This is uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, Serbia, Montenegro, 
uh, the, in Macedonia. These were all formerly part of a single country called Yugoslavia. This took place in the 80s. Okay. Now, after World War II, there's nothing going on. A Cold War, a war between the United States and the Soviet Union, or the, the uh, Western powers, which included Western Europe and the Soviet Union, as they competed for influence around the world. Okay. So you can see on the map here so the division of that, some neutral countries as well. Uh, and over here we see uh, Nikita Khrushchev uh, arm wrestling with John F. Kennedy uh, over the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay. Another example of cultural diffusion as ideas spread from one place to another is things like jazz and rock and roll. I keep giving you examples because on the quiz, on the test rather, there's going to be a question asking which of the following is an example of cultural diffusion. Okay, last two slides, sorry, these are a bit boring, but these are terms, so I'll go through them, explain them a little bit, you write them down, have them on your study guide, here we go. Topography, this is the mountains, hills, plains of a region. We're talking about the geography and the changes in geography in that region. Okay, vegetation refers to the plant life of a region. Okay, around here, a few trees, lots of fields with corn or soybeans in them. Now, we are a Judeo-Christian uh, civilization. Most people here are Christians in the United States, um, actually more Muslims now than Jews in America. But in other places in early civilizations, they believed not just in one God like we do, but they believed in many gods. And this is the idea of polytheism. Instead of monotheism, mono, one, they have poly, many, polytheism, the worship of more than one God. Now, we think we're famous for being a democracy, and we're a particular kind of democracy. We are a republic. We choose the leaders who represent us, not just the president, but we don't make the laws. It's our legislators in Springfield, uh, our congressmen and senators in Washington, D.C. They represent us, and because we elect them to represent us, we have a republic or a republican form of government. Okay? And we say that idea of diffusion is that spread of ideas and goods. Uh, and not just, you know, goods is more the diffusion, but we spread ideas and they get adopted. That's that idea of cultural diffusion. And we've mentioned nomads before. Again, those are people who move from place to place in order to find food. There are still some nomadic groups around in the world today. Uh, perhaps the Bedouin in the Arabian Peninsula might be the best example of that, that I can think of. Okay. Now, capital. And you notice on your study guide it says capital in an economic sense. We're not talking about the capital of the country or the capital of my state. We're talking about money used in business to make a profit. Okay, To build a factory or build some item, I've got to build I have the machines, I've got to build a factory, I've got to hire the workers. All that requires money. Money in economic terms is capital. Cash crops, these are things where many development developing nations rely on the sale of these. This is that idea of uh, the Europeans, when they colonized them, wanted to, do, to grow these things for us. For example, a good example might be bananas. And a lot of Central American countries for the longest time, that was their primary income. But the plantations were owned by Americans, and they were growing these cash crops, which were then exported to America and other places as well. We mentioned culture, but this is the all of the things that make up a people's way of life. And so that's what you want to know for the test. Privatization is when you had a state-owned businesses and we're selling these to investors. This is the idea of we had a command economy where not only did we tell you where to work and what to produce and how much to produce, we actually own the factories you worked in. Uh, governments are realizing they're not as good at doing that and controlling things, and so they're selling those off to private investors with the goal of them making more money and the state making more money and improving efficiency. Literacy, hey, the ability to read and write, this is something that is taught in schools. Another aspect of culture, uh, originally taught by parents, now something that is reinforced and expanded in schools. And then finally, we look at this idea of population density, which is sort of a measure of how many people are living uh, in an area. Usually we use per square mile uh, or per square kilometer if we're in, using the metric system. But this is something that's higher in cities, the higher the number of people per square mile or whatever we're using, then the higher the population density, okay? Rural areas like around Monoc, much lower population density, okay? Well, that's the uh, vast majority of chapters one and two, sort of our introduction uh, on a very fast term here of what's going on in West, uh, rural cultures. Any questions, see me in class. Thanks.